How y'all doing? Y'all doing good? My name is uh, Paris Cunningham. I serve in the Bronx Ministry in New York City. All right. And this is uh, you come up, you come and introduce yourself. Introduce yourself. <laughs> and uh, what's up, guys? My name is Kurt Flinchball, and I'm the campus minister for the Philadelphia Church of Christ. All right. And so, so you guys have came to the class that is titled. Love over lust, not the other way around. Don't get it twisted, okay? Yeah. Love over lust. So we're gonna we're gonna really jump into this um, because we don't have a lot of time. We got a lot to cover. I really want you guys to be taking some notes. Uh, please be ready. This even this first part it's gonna be a little roundabout way of going about it. Something a little different, but follow me. All right? Y'all gonna follow me? Y'all trust me? Yep. Yeah. All right. Good. 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 That's good. Now, 1945. 1945. There was a war, and Nazi Germany was pretty much in control of Germany, and they were putting Jews in concentration camps. There was, uh, at the end, around 1945, they, they liberated this concentration camp, and uh, one lieutenant there was writing in his journal of what he saw when he entered into the concentration camp. I want to read a little excerpt from his journal. Come on, um, Kind of helps set the tone here. He said... When he was there, this is what he wrote. He said, I could give, I can give no adequate description of the horror camp in which my men and myself were to spend the next few months of our lives. It was just a barren wilderness, as bare as a chicken run. Corpses lie everywhere, some in huge piles. Sometimes they lie singly or in pairs. When they were when they had fallen, when they had fallen, where they had fallen. It took a little time to get used to seeing men, women, and children collapse as you walk by them. One knew that about 500 a day were dying, and that 500 a day were going to go on dying from some minor sickness that could have been healed if they had a nurse. One saw a woman drowning in her own vomit. They were so weak that they couldn't turn over. Men were eating worms as they clinched loaves of bread, purely because they had to eat worms in order to live, and they had forgotten what it was like on which one was more important. Piles of corpse lie naked and obscene. With a woman too weak to stand, she propped herself up against a pile of corpse as she cooked the food that was given over an open fire. Men and women crouching down anywhere in the open, revealing themselves. There is a huge tank of water in which the remains of a children float, of children floated inside. This is horrible, right? Why is it horrible? This is the question that I want to ask. What makes what I just read to you guys so horrific? Okay, all right. Okay. Mm, I like that. Human potential is lost. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, people have to suffer. Go ahead in the back. Mm, yeah, devalued. And I want to hold on to some of these statements, all right? Hold on to some of these things because, you know, we can ask, you know, this is horrific, this is tragic. What, 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 why is this happening, right? Is it because people shouldn't eat worms? No, that's not it. Is it because piles of corpse are bad? No, that's not it. I think the main reason this is horrible is because no one should live under these type of conditions. No one. No one should live under these type of conditions. And the goal of a concentration camp is two things, right? The goal of a concentration camp is to demoralize, right? Demoralize, which is to deconstruct or destroy what is right, good, and moral about an individual and dehumanize, which is to deconstruct or destroy what is human about an individual. What is human about an individual. Now the process, when someone would walk into a concentration camp, right, the process typically looked like this. They'd come in, they would shave, they would strip you naked, man, woman, or child. Strip you naked, man, woman, or child. 
You come in, once they shoot you naked, they would shave you bald, man, woman, or child. Then they would brand a tattoo, brand or tattoo, a number on your neck, man, woman, or child. Then they would shove them in large cages based upon their physical attributes, man, woman, or child. You know, this type of demoralizing and dehumanization went on in Nazi Germany for about 12 years. A similar thing went on in America for about 400 years, where people were subjected and even started to accept this type of treatment. This basically is how you would treat an animal, right? I mean, it's wicked in of itself, but it's how you would treat like an animal. You would put them in cages, make them work. You would separate them based on their physical attributes. But there's something fundamentally wrong when you start treating people like this, right? We all feel that. We all feel there's something wrong. This isn't right. You didn't. I didn't need to tell you this was wrong, right? By reading it, you knew this was bad. Come on. And so the reason why this is bad is because people aren't animals, right? We're different. We're different. There's something special about us. In Genesis 1, it says, God said, let us make mankind in what? Our image, not, not your image, right? His image, in God's image, in his likeness. And then he gave us control over everything, the animals, the, all the other stuff, right? We were putting control. So obviously there's something different about humanity, right? We are not God, right? We're not God, regardless of what Kanye West thinks. We're not God, okay? And we're never going to be God. That's the reality. But there's something that God has placed in mankind. There's something God has put in all, in all of us that we reflect God's likeness and who he is. Everybody, everywhere, bears the divine image of God. Everyone. So let's go back to high school, right? We're going back. Some of us, it might be longer for yeah. Sam Powell. But everyone else, <laughs> everyone, right? We go back to high school. We've all been there. We all understand this. You're standing with your boys, right? Standing with your boys in high school. You, you're near the locker. You're on the corner. You're in the cafeteria. And a girl walks by, right? Girl walks by. And someone asks this question or variation of this question. If you've been there, you can raise your hand if you understand where I'm going, right? Someone's asked either this question or variation. How do you rate that? You ever heard that question, right? A variation of that question. How do you rate that? Okay, how many of y'all ask that question? Not, not in Sam's school. They, they didn't do that. The Sam's spiritual. You know, that's why we have them here. You know, right? Right? We've been there. We understand this, right? This is typical man code. We've been in this situation. Now, we take turns. Once you ask that question, we take turns assigning a numerical value to parts of that physical anatomy, right? And then we start discussing in great value how we would evaluate that physical attributes, right? Oh, y'all trying to act real bougie, like y'all super spiritual. Don't front. All y'all been there, all right? Don't front, okay? I know on, you're at church, but we've been there. We've done this, right? Yep. You sit there, we're like, oh, she's hot, she's not, whatever, right? We've been there, you do this, okay? This is the way it is. Our society embraces this type of thinking, right? It embraces it. It's what we see, our shows, magazines are dedicated to the who's hot and who's not, right? That's just the way it is. They call this what? Pop culture, right? What does pop culture mean? Popular. Popular. Oh, you, you read my notes, so you know you're not Don't answer my questions. All right. <laughs> Popular, right? <laughs> Popular culture, which means that everyone accepts and is subjected to this type of treatment, right? We all accept it, and we're subjected to it, right? So we label people, and guess what? We get labeled as well, right? We're all part of it. It's part of the culture that we live in. Now, this whole that situation, the problem is when that, the that that we're talking about is actually a she. The that is actually a she. It's a person. She's a woman with a name, with feelings. 
And see, it's harmless until you're the that. You know, then the girl, she feels hurt. We feel hurt. It's degrading, it's violating, and it does something damaging to the human soul. Something real damaging to who we are as individuals, right? And so when she becomes a that, dangerous things happen. Now follow me here, all right? There's a scripture, one of the famous scriptures. When you talk about lust, what do people typically go to? What was Matthew? Matthew 5, 20. Oh, you are, this is, there we go. We got some scripture knowing brothers, all right? What does Matthew 5 say? No, I'm gonna go there. Go ahead. All right, something like that. Now y'all stumbling over it. Okay, y'all need to read y'all Bibles. Y'all, all right, I was getting encouraged, all right? There we go. Matthew 5, 27, verse 30 says, You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her where? In his, heart. In his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, causes you to stumble, gouge it out. This get a little crazy. Gouge it out and throw it, in, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown into hell. Now here's, this is crazy. Let's think about this. How many of you guys still have two arms? How many of you guys still have two eyes? Okay, so you guys must be perfect, right? Like y'all obviously don't struggle with this. Why are you here? Why are you even in this class? Everybody got their arms and their eyes, so you're not struggling, right? Oh, oh, you are struggling. I, I, do we struggle with this? So why you guys still got your eyes and your arms? Because you ain't reading your Bible, that's why. <laughs> you know, this scripture's radical. This scripture's radical. Not to mention, it's very violent and painful. Right? And if it was taken literally, half the world's population would be blind and with no arms. Right? If it was taken literally. Amen. That we don't take a little. But here's the irony of this. Is that I think that even blind people can have lustful thoughts, right? Yeah, you know, I have to ask Stevie Wonder when I get a chance, but I'm just like, I'm sure <laughs> that even blind people struggle with lustful thoughts. So what, I mean, there, there's got to be something a little bit more to Jesus telling us to gouge our eyes out. That can't be alone the solution, right? Amen. Jesus must be saying something a little bit bigger. So here's where we're going to go. We're going to, follow me here, try to examine this with me. How do we get from lust, which is a common sin that we all struggle with, right? Show of hands. We all struggle with it. We all agree. We all struggle with this. How do we get from lust, which is a common sin, to being thrown into hell? How, how do we get there, right? And in order to avoid being thrown into hell, you got to do self-mutilation. All right, we need, we need some answers here, right? I think a lot of this has to do with our view of heaven and hell. Right? I think a lot of us do with our view of heaven. Where is heaven? Oh, you know. <laughs> it's, like, it's like my son. He's one of yourself. Oh, you know what I mean? He says yeah. it. Where is hell? Down. Y'all are mad. Okay. Geographic. We don't need any geography. What? <laughs> right? That's how you do it? Boop. All right. Good. All right. Typically, we view heaven and hell based on geographical location. Yep. Right? That's how we typically view it. Oh, yeah. Heaven upstairs. Hell downstairs. No one wants to live downstairs. Right? <laughs> That's not a bad as it is. So, that's how we view it. But to a Jewish audience, they didn't necessarily just view heaven and hell as a geographical location. They actually viewed heaven and hell a little bit different. See, heaven is where things are as God intended them to be in the Jewish mindset. Heaven is things are as God intended them to be, where things are under the rule and reign of God. That buzz could be anywhere right that's why the church is what an extension of what God's kingdom where is the church at we ain't floating around somewhere we might be on the second floor but we still on earth right we still on earth God's church is a reflection of heaven right it's a reflection of heaven it's a reflection of 
God's rule and his reign and his sovereignty is lived out right here. Right here with us. It could be anywhere, anytime with anybody. In Psalms 115, the Bible says, verse 16, it says, The heavens, the heights, the heights of heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to mankind. The earth is given to man. So who runs the earth? Mankind. It's good. Y'all following the scriptures with me. That's awesome. Yeah. Now, if the, the earth is ran by mankind, that means we could do what we want to do with the earth, right? We live how we want to live. We could choose to live under God's rule or we could do what? Choose the opposite. Choose to live some other way. So people could place themselves, you know, under God's rule. We could choose not to. Now, what do you call a situation, a location, a place that is not under the rule and supremacy of God? Worldly. Hell, right? In a lot of ways, it's kind of like, whoa, this, is, this isn't this is normal. It's called hell. There's statements like, you ever heard when people say, statements like, uh, you know, something was a living hell. Right? Are they talking about a geographical location, up in the sky, or down underground? No, they're talking about this place that they were at was void of any love, any peace, any beauty, any meaning, right? They say war zones could be hellish. They say divorces are like being in emotional, they use a the term, hell. Right? A divorce is so painful. It's devoid of God. Any meaning, any purpose, any love. Famine. Places that are famine, people say it's like going through hell. Seeing children starving. Right? Concentration camps that we just read was described as just that. People living in hell. It wasn't underground. It was right here on earth. Plantations will look the same way. Same exact way. So what Jesus is saying here in Matthew 5 is that Jesus is saying that something serious, sometimes even hellish, happens when people are treated as objects. And that we should resist that by any means necessary. Even if it means hurting yourself to help someone else from experiencing that hell. See, hell, the hell or lust has that has imposed upon us of people is tragic. The hell that we put people through because of our lust is tragic. It's painful. Like concentration camps. When we're lusting, we strip women of their identity. We brand them with a number. And, and we throw them in cages based upon their physical attributes. This is what we do to women. We don't even know. It's funny, we, we live in a generation now, we don't even know how to properly relate to the opposite sex. To have a normal relationship. Because we're so used to treating them as an object. You know, John Mayer said this. John Mayer, a famous singer, wrote this down. He said, why have a relationship with a woman where you have to talk, deal with issues, and be hurt when you can look at porn and get everything you want without being hurt or exposed? No waste of time and no investment. He was serious. And this is, I mean, you look at John Mayer, and, but then you ask, this man has dated some of the most attractive, quote unquote from the world says, most attractive women. And you see why he can't hold a relationship. He can't hold a relationship because his mindset, we say he's a jerk, John Mayer's a jerk. Well, he's a jerk because of his addiction to pornography. It's desensitized him on how to even relate to a woman. Because a woman to him is what? An object. It's an ob she's an object. And we can see that. You know, in the world that we live in, 56% of divorces, divorce cases, 
involve uh, involve one party in the marriage who was obsessively invested in searching and looking at pornographic websites. 56% of divorces. We see what divorce has done to our society. What it's done to families. I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand, but some of us are from broken homes, right? We're the product of a broken home, single parent household. This is this is this this damaging thing that lust creates. It destroys us. It hurts us. They say women in relationship with someone who's uh, who's addicted to pornography and looking at pornographic websites. They say that. Women who are in those type of relationships, they reflect similar symptoms as someone who has PTSD. Similar symptoms as someone who has PTSD. You know, CNN did an interview with an author of a book called Pornland. And, um, you know, they, uh, they asked him, they asked him, they're like, you know, what are producers and the industry owner saying about saying to you about where the industry is headed. They asked him about the pornography industry. Like this is a one of the most profitable businesses in America, billion dollar industry, right? They're like, you know, what if, what are the producers and everyone saying about the industry right now? What are they saying? Listen to what he says. He says, Well, I think a lot of them in the porn industry don't know themselves because they feel like they feel like they say to me, this feels like a runaway train. And what happens is, I think they're taken by, by surprise at, how, at just how cruel and body punishing the fans are asking for. I mean, they are surprised that the fans are going this far down the road to hardcore. And the question is, where is this industry going? Nobody actually knows because there's nothing left to do to the female body anymore that hasn't already been done. There is nothing left to do to the female body that hasn't already been done. Think about that. That's tragic. That's tragic. You know, three months ago in Lower Manhattan, there was a raid for sex trafficking. Over 500 women, ages 8 to 65, were rescued from living in cages. 500 women. They were being used to record sex videos that are posted online that we view whenever we look at pornography. Women ranging from the ages eight to 65. This is the world that we created because we haven't learned how to master this desire called lust. 90% of the women, 90% of porn viewed online has an affiliation with sex trafficking. 90%. 90% of the porn viewed online has an affiliation with sex trafficking. And they say women who normally volunteer for porn videos, they have been raped themselves. So we need to stop and we got to ask, okay, Jesus, when you made this statement, right? We read Matthew 5, we're like, whoa, that's a little extreme. Gouge your eye out, cut our arms off, like, good night. Why are you so serious about this lust thing? Yeah. Because look at the hell it creates on earth. Yeah. That's why he's so serious about this lust thing. On, when we don't learn to control our desires, we contribute to the demoralization and the dehumanizing of women. 
We contribute to that. The question is now, that lies before you. Okay, so this is the lust problem. How do we overcome that? What do we do? And that's where the next part of the sermon comes in. So I'm gonna have my brother come up and share. All right. Amen, brothers. Open to me in Matthew 12. I appreciate so much of what Paris just shared. And even the fact that, like, we can get so deceived about the sin that we're committing and not realize how destructive it truly is. But when you really stop and think about it, there's not a single person in this room who at some level doesn't know that impurity is wrong. The, the need of the hour, the cry for our generation is not for us to understand how bad this is, even though we need to call it out. We need to be convicted. We need to understand the pain and the damage we're doing. But that's not the greatest need. The greatest need is for us to have victory in this area. Yeah. That every one of us in this room in some way, shape, or form, we're in here because we are trying to figure out how do we have victory. Right. You know, before I became a Christian, the greatest most destructive, addictive sin in my life was pornography. That I grew up Catholic. I grew up going to church. I grew up with the knowledge that this was wrong. I remember the first time being 12 years old, masturbating for the first time. And we're men in this room. I'm going to get real because Satan wants us to lie to ourselves. The first time I masturbated, I remember feeling like God was going to smite me right there. I knew it was wrong. I waited a couple days and... I was still breathing, so I ended up masturbating again. And with every time I gave an imp uh, impurity or pornography, the need, the fix became greater and greater. At my best, I, I hate it that I was impure. I hate it that I looked at pornography and hid it from my parents. I hate it that something had mastery over my life, but I couldn't stop. At my best, I was able to go maybe once every three or four days without masturbating. At my worst, I was masturbating about three times a day. The longest, before I studied the Bible, before I became a Christian, the longest period of time I ever went without masturbating was 40 days for the Lent. And I celebrated by Easter morning masturbating like four times. That this was an addiction in my life. And I remember the first time someone sat down and started studying the Bible with me and showing me that this was going to send me to hell. And that God offered me something so much greater than anything that this internet fake world could provide. Mm -hmm. And for the first time in my life, I was able to have victory. Amen. And I went cold turkey. I didn't look at pornography. I didn't masturbate. I went three straight months absolutely pure. But during that time, in that three months, I started getting prideful. And to be honest, one of my bigger sins is independence. And I started pushing people out of my life. And I started having areas in my life where I refused to talk to brothers about. Yep. That I didn't want to get advice about the movies I was watching. That I didn't want to get advice about what my roommates were talking about and what kind of music I listened to. That I didn't want to get advice about my dating relationship or what kind of boundaries we should have. And I started having areas where no one could talk to me about it. That I felt like you were invading my area, my life. And I got protective. And I got defensive. And I pushed people out. And for a while, my willpower was enough. And then I fell once. And as soon as I reopened that door, impurity flooded back into my life. Four months old as a Christian, I started hating this walk. I didn't want to be impure. I didn't want to masturbate. I didn't want to look at porn. But no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't seem to stop. And brothers would talk to me about it, and I didn't want to talk to them because I felt they would look down on me as a failure. And then in my mind, I said, well, when I conquer this, then I'll tell someone what's going on. And I kept pushing through, and I kept falling. And eventually, my mindset got so bitter that I started looking at the promises of the Bible about purity and righteousness and godliness as if they didn't apply to me. And I started looking at other brothers and being like, what's better about you that you can live this life? And then at my lowest point, I ended up being impure with my girlfriend. And after that moment, both of us came within an inch of falling away. I got bitter towards everyone in the church. I started thinking midweeks are optional. 
I refused to get help in any area. And I would cry out, and I was so jacked up in my thought that I would lay down and I would cry out to God, asking him to give me purity and asking him. And, and, and the crazy thing is I'd want to pray for purity, but I start praying, God, give me a way out. Show me a way that this is okay. And I started deceiving myself and trying to come up with reasons why it was okay that I was this way. And then by the grace of God, I went to an ACR conference. ACR is the region that Philly and a bunch of the, the churches are a part of. And I went to this conference and I went to a purity lesson. And God put my heart in a blender. You know, I spent the whole lesson trying not to cry in the back row. And that night, I went on the beach. We were, we were in Hampton Roads, Virginia Beach. And I prayed out to God. I cried out to God till 3 in the morning, just confessing my sin, asking for help. And we had a seven-hour ride home, and I had one brother in the car that knew me and two brothers that I met two days before that. And we get in the, in the car, and the brother I know falls asleep immediately. And within the first five minutes getting on the highway, the brother driving turns around, looks at me, and says, how was, the, how, was the, how was the conference? What lesson hit you the most? And I was like, oh, the purity lesson. And he goes, well, why? And I said, well, I'm struggling. I don't know how he did it without hitting a car, but he took his eyes completely off the road, turned around and stared at me and went, are you struggling or sinning? And it just was like word vomit. And I got open. I got embarrassingly open. And those brothers spent the next seven hours rebuking my face off. It was like shotgunning scriptures. I just heard them be like, hold on a sec. Like, you know when you're flipping the pages, you put a finger on a page, flip a couple pages, put another finger on the page, so you can just like, boom, 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 straight through the scriptures? The two brothers did that. And they spent about three hours rebuking me. And then the brother that I knew woke up, heard the conversation, and restarted the whole thing. <laughs> they loved me. And I praise God almost every week that they had the courage to challenge me that whole car ride. Amen. That they didn't just turn the radio on and say, God's got you, bro. That they loved me enough to be in my face. To challenge my pride, my independence, my deceit, yep. and my impurity. Right. The truth is, the hour, the need that each one of us has, the need that our world has is for this room to go one year of being completely pure. Come on. That that is what we need. We need men to stand up and say, I live a pure life. I have had victory yeah. over my defeats. Amen. The incredible thing is, no matter how bad it is right now, that God can turn that into a victory. What we're going to look at today in my lesson, the title of my part of the lesson is The Answer to Lust is Love. And we are going to look at three questions. Am I answering these three questions? I pray that you will be able to live a pure life, that you will be able to stand up here one day and share about the victory God has done through your purity. Amen? Amen. My first question is what do I do? What do I do? And the answer to that is fill the void. Matthew 12, starting verse 43. When an evil spirit comes out of a man and it goes through place er, and it goes through places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that man is worse than the first. That's how it will be with this wicked generation. That in Jesus' own words, that he gives you a simple plan to be pure. The very first step, and I appreciate so much what Paris just shared. The very first thing you got to do to be pure is take out the garbage. Get the trash out of your life. You have to remove the sin. You have to remove the demons. Uh, just a side note, and, and I can't help but say this, but stop watching shows with nudity. If you're trying to be pure, I don't care how incredible the plot is. I don't care how relatable you'll be if you can talk about it. It's not worth help. I've never watched Game of Thrones because of softcore porn, and I still relate to people. You don't need it. What kind of music are you listening to? I don't care how sick the beat is. The sound of angels is greater in heaven. You don't need it. You will not miss out on life by cutting things out of your life. Take out the trash. But once you take out the trash, the reason so many of us fail 
is we start off great. We come to these lessons. We get so inspired. We clap. We get fired up. We go home. We delete songs. We get covenant eyes. And all those things are great. But we fail because we spend our energy resisting rather than replacing. That if you don't replace that hole, if you don't fill that void with God, it'll come back. That in Jesus' own words, temptation is a fact of life. You go two days pure, you'll still be tempted one day. I don't care if you go a week pure, you're going to be tempted. You could go a month pure, you'll be tempted. I haven't looked at pornography or masturbated in over four years, and I still get tempted some days. That you, as long as you are still breathing, temptation is an issue for you. And if you spend your energy resisting temptation instead of replacing that void, you will fall. Just think about it for a second. If I say, don't think about a red fire truck, everyone in here just pictured a red fire truck. If I say, don't look in the back of the room, you don't want to see what's going on, all of you guys really want to look in the back of the room. And your minds are like, well, what's going on? A couple people just turned around too, right? That as soon as we, like, even think about it, like, don't look at porn, don't look at porn, don't look at porn. All of a sudden, you're on YouTube. Don't look at porn, don't look at porn, don't look at porn. Google, don't look at porn, don't look at porn. You're going a million miles an hour and you can't stop. That if you spend your energy resisting, the image stays in your head. But Jesus is saying, if you replace that, if you fill that void, if you fill that need with something else, there's no room for lust to come back. If you're trying to be pure, where are you replacing things in your life? You know, just to be honest, even as I'm looking at this lesson, I hate Satan, by the way, like with a passion. Christians are allowed to hate Satan and sin. I hate both with a passion. Even as I was looking up pictures for this, I was trying to pull up things and everything. I have safe search on my Google, and all of a sudden images started popping up. I typed in love over lust to get a little image to pop up, and I was like, bad idea, and I like minimized the thing right away. And instead of sitting there and being like, don't think about what you just saw, don't think about what you just saw, I just immediately opened up a new page, typed in Jesus on the cross, and just stared at it for a couple minutes. That I just remembered this is what Jesus died for. That this is what my purity does. If I'm impure, this is what it does to the Son of God. That we need to replace the void in our life. So what do I fill myself with? If I have to replace it, what do I fill it with? That's my second question. What do I fill myself with? And the answer to that is love. Turn to Matthew 22. Matthew 22, starting in verse 34. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. The truth is that if you're so filled with love, there's no room for lust. That the answer to lust is love. The greatest commandment, I love Jesus' own words. He says, the greatest commandment is not be pure. That's important. That's not the greatest commandment. The greatest commandment is not obey. He's not like, what's the greatest commandment? He's like, obey the commandments, straight obedience. No. He says the greatest commandment is love. So why does love overcome lust? Well, the first point is when you love someone, you don't want to hurt them. I think one of the biggest mindset problems that so many of us have that we truly do need metanoia, mindset repentance in, is we look at sin the wrong way. That we look at sin as if it's a breaking of a rule. And to give you an example, imagine we're up here and we're on the second floor. And let's say you kind of start wandering in and out during my lesson and you're not really paying attention, which no one would do. (laughs) Especially the Philly brothers in here. And he looked out a window and all of a sudden you saw someone getting mugged. We are in New York City. Well, close. And let's say you saw someone getting mugged. You'd be angry. And your first thought is, that's wrong. Someone needs to punish that guy. I hope he gets caught and punished for what he just did. And we can't get caught up in the idea that that's how God sees sin. Then we sing, God says, no, that's wrong. You need to be punished. But that's not true. Don't turn there. But Genesis 6, 5 and 6 says that sin 
grieves God, that it fills his heart with pain. That in God's eyes, sin is not the breaking of a rule, it's the violation of a relationship. That sin is everyone. Raise your hand if you want to get married one day. I mean, I'm already married, so I love being married, but if you want to get married, raise your hand. Amen? Now put your hands down. Imagine you've been married for five years. Say you got a little kid. You go home to work, and you have a ton of PTO. Pay time off, in case you don't actually have a job now. Pay time off. And you decide, you know what? I want to surprise my wife. I'm going to go home. So you go up to your boss. You're like, hey, I'm just going to take a mental day. And they let you go because you got a ton of PTO, and you go home. And you go, all right, it's 9 o'clock. By this point, my wife has put our kid on the bus, and she's probably home doing dishes or cleaning. I'm going to stop, and I'm going to get a movie. I'm going to get breakfast. I'm going to get some flowers. And you pull in, and you see the car, her car in the garage, and you go, it's like, oh, sweet, she's home. I'm going to be able to surprise her. And you walk in the front door, and, and you kind of listen, and she's not anywhere downstairs, but you, you kind of hear, like, faint laughter upstairs. She's like, all right, she's watching TV. Perfect. And you get a tray, and you put the flowers on it. And you put out the breakfast and you put on a nice little plate for breakfast in bed and you walk upstairs and you walk in your bedroom and you find your wife in bed with another man. How do you feel? Betrayed. Angry. She didn't just break a rule. She literally violated your relationship. She made you feel worthless. Empty. As if everything you've given her isn't enough for her. That's what our sin does to God. That when you sin, when you go and you look at pornography, what you're telling God is, God, I, I love that Jesus died for me, and I, I love everything else you give me, but that's not enough. Yep. I need this other thing. And we cheat on God. We go outside of God, and we cause him pain. If you love God, you do not want to cause him pain. Look at that picture. Sin hurts God. Our sin did that. Every time I chose to masturbate, I put a lash on him. Physically and emotionally, our sin hurts God. And if you love God, you don't want to hurt him. I love Paris sharing about the pornography industry and how, and how bad it is. And one of the things that, that really hit me is I love my wife. And I think about this idea that I would never want to hurt my wife. So much so that I can stand here and say I'm, not, I'm never going to cheat on my wife. And the reason I can say that is because I don't care how bad I'm tempted. I don't care how attractive someone is. I'm telling you right now that I would never want to destroy her emotionally like that. That I don't want to hurt her. And on the flip side, I don't want anyone else to hurt anyone. That if you put my wife in a cage, I'm losing my job. I'm going to be struggling with sin. I'm going to show up at your house. I'm going to need some disciples to talk to me because we're going to have some words. That's someone I love. You don't hurt her. God loves every single person on this planet. Why are you hurting them? Why are you using them as an object? The second reason that love overcomes lust, oh, sorry, is when you have love, why would you want anything else? Well, let's, let's use this analogy for a second. Let's say that, I don't know, Maybe Sam Powell had stood up yesterday and, and led a lesson about love. And let's say he led a lesson about love and he, he, he kind of challenged all of our campus ministers to really love you guys. And let's say your campus minister takes that to heart and they come to you today and say, you know what? I'm going to take you out for dinner tonight. I'm going to take you out and I'm going to pay for your dinner. And it's going to be your choice. You have two options. And money is no option. I literally want to give you an amazing dinner. The first option is a beautiful steak. And he says, I will take you out for a five-star steak, asparagus on the side, an amazing steak, and we can go right to Outback, right next door. On me, my treat. Or you could have a hamburger. We could go to McDonald's, and I'll get you a dollar menu fake hamburger. Let's be real. I want you to raise your hand if you honestly say you would get that hamburger. You would get the hamburger over the steak? I'm going to tell your campus minister that. And when they go out to buy you dinner, they're going to take you there. <laughs> I, if, I, if someone offered me that, 
Are you kidding me? I'd be like, we're going to Outback. Actually, I'd be like, we're going to Texas Roadhouse. We're going to find one. I want a steak. I love Paul Newman was a, a famous actor throughout the 60s, all the way through up until when he passed away in 2008. And he's one of the few Hollywood stars, few Hollywood icons to be able to actually be righteous in his marriage, to have a good marriage, to never commit adultery, to stay faithful and not get divorced. And one day a, a reporter asked him, how have you managed to be so famous and so involved in Hollywood and never commit adultery? And he looked at the reporter and he said, well, why would I go looking for hamburger when I have steak at home? That if you love God, why would you go looking for anything else? Lust is garbage. I know from my own life that after you masturbate, you feel like crap. And I normally don't like using that word, but this is the one time I'm okay with it from the pulpit. That after you masturbate, you feel like straight garbage. And you end up doing it again because you still feel worse about it. And the only way you know how to feel better about yourself is to do it. If you have the love of God, if you can be fulfilled, if you can find meaning, peace, security, validity in God's love, why would you go looking for garbage? In your life, where are you going after hamburgers rather than steak? Where are you deciding that you want to have garbage rather than God? Brothers, we need to have this love. The truth is, we need to fill ourselves completely with love. And, and, and the thing that scares me is I think so often in my life, I got that on the intellectual level. But I didn't really understand how to love. Yep. And so my third and final question is, how do I love? Sacrifice. And the answer is sacrifice. And turn me to 1 Corinthians 13. While you guys are turning there, don't zone me out. As men, we have an issue with this scripture. That in our minds, 1 Corinthians 13 is a feminine scripture. And when someone preaches it, we start thinking about, Love and fairy tales. But the truth is that love is the manliest thing you could ever be. Jesus was the perfect example of manhood. Amen? Yeah. That he was the ideal man. And yet the one word you could describe him with is love. That love above everything else, true love, is the godliest of all characteristics. Yeah. That is what true manliness means. And I'm not talking the love that the world defines us here. This, this puffed up feeling that we receive. I'm talking about scriptural love. 1 Corinthians 13, starting verse 4. This is the Bible's definition. It says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. Always trusts. Always hopes. Always perseveres that you could summarize this entire passage by saying that love focuses on other people that how do i love i f i focus on others that if lust going off of Paris's definition the definition of lust is looking at someone and saying what can i take from her what can i take from this thing love says what can i give how can I serve? Don't turn there, but in John 15, 13, Jesus himself says, greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Love means sacrifice. When was the last time you truly sacrificed for God? When was the last time you sold a pair of Jordans to feed someone in your campus ministry who couldn't eat? When was the last time you sold a pair of Jordans for special missions contribution? When was the last time you decided to go without a meal to feed a homeless person? When was the last time you took a sister on an encouragement date who you had zero interest in? When was the last time that you had a special date with God? When was the last time that you went out of your way to have an amazing quiet time, drove a half hour to your favorite prayer spot. If 
just in general, how are your quiet times? Are you actually being sacrificial about your time with God and planning it and waking up early? Or are you just doing it when it's convenient? Love only comes from sacrificing. Men, to be honest, to be honest with each and every one of you in this room, the reason that so many of you in this room cannot stop being impure is because you can't stop focusing on yourself. That our generation is all about me. What can I get? What can I do? What makes me feel great? And that mindset leads directly into impurity. That if you want to be pure, you need to learn to focus on God and other people. You need to learn to put other people's needs before your own. When Jesus came to the earth, he wasn't thinking of anything but you. He gave up everything because he loved you. Even in your life, when was the time in your life where you felt the most loved? When you realize that Jesus died for you. Love is sacrificing. And the incredible thing is so, so often we look at love and love feels great to receive but it feels even greater to give. But if you actually give love, if you give yourself to loving people, it'll be that much greater. Brothers, in conclusion, let us stand up and be pure. Let us go one solid year. Let us conquer this and have victory in our lives, the same victory that God has promised you. It has been over four and a half years since the last time I looked at pornography because of God. My first kiss with my wife in over two years. The first time I gave her a kiss, I wouldn't be okay with you giving my mother was our wedding day. That God can give you victory if you're willing to love him. What do I need to do? Fill the void. What do I fill it with? Love. How do I love? Sacrifice. To God be the glory. We have five minutes left. Paris is going to come back up and we'll do like two or three Q&A. All right, so we got any questions?